I'm going to go straight on with the book of Acts this evening with what at first sight is a most unpromising chapter and uh, I hope you won't be left sort of saying after we've read it now what on earth is he going to make of that with some curiosity but I believe that God has something to say to us through this chapter tonight and I believe that the most discerning of you will see a very unusual application of God's word from Acts chapter 21 to the service this evening. Acts chapter 21. We finish this morning with Paul weeping with a group of Christians on the quayside at Miletus because they would never see him again. He's going to Jerusalem for the last time. We said goodbye to them and left. After sailing straight across, we came to Kos. The next day we reached Rhodes, and from there we went on to Patera. There we found a ship that was going to Phoenicia, so we went aboard and sailed away. We came to where we could see Cyprus and sailed south of it on to Syria. We went ashore at Tyre, where the ship was going to unload its cargo, and we found some believers there and stayed with them a week. By the power of the Spirit, they told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But when our time with them was, was over, we left and went on our way. All of them, with their wives and children, went with us out of the city, and we all knelt down on the beach and prayed. Then we said goodbye to one another, and we went on board the ship while they went back home. We continued our voyage, sailing from Tyre to Ptolemais, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day and the following day we left and arrived in Caesarea there we went to the house of the evangelist Philip and stayed with him he was one of the seven men who had been chosen in Jerusalem he had four unmarried daughters who proclaimed God's message we had been there for several days when a prophet named Agabus arrived from Judea he came to us and took Paul's belt tied up his own feet and hands with it and said this is what the Holy Spirit says the owner of this belt will be tied up in this way by the Jews in Jerusalem and they will hand him over to the Gentiles when we heard this we and the others there begged Paul not to go to Jerusalem but he answered what are you doing crying like this and breaking my heart I am ready not only to be tied up in Jerusalem, but even to die there for the sake of the Lord Jesus. We could not convince him, so we gave up and said, May the Lord's will be done. After spending some time there, we got our things ready and left for Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also went with us and took us to the house of the man we were going to stay with, Nason from Cyprus who had been a believer since the early days. When we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to see James, and all the church elders were present. Paul greeted them and gave a complete report of everything that God had done among the Gentiles through his work. After hearing him, they all praised God. Then they said to Paul, You can see how it is, brother, there are thousands of Jews who have become believers and they are all very devoted to the law. They have been told about you that you have been teaching all the Jews who live in Gentile countries to abandon the law of Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or follow the Jewish customs. They are sure to hear that you have arrived. What should be done then? Do what we tell you. There are four men here who have taken a vow. Go along with them and join them in the ceremony of purification and pay their expenses. Then they will be able to shave their heads. In this way, everyone will know that there is no truth in any of the things that they have been told about you, but that you yourself live in accordance with the law of Moses. But as to the Gentiles who have become believers, we have sent them a letter telling them we decided that they must not eat any food that had been offered to idols or any blood or any animal that has been strangled and that they must keep themselves from immorality. So Paul took the men and the next day performed the ceremony of purification with them. 
Then he went into the temple and gave notice of how many days it would be until the end of the period of purification, when the sacrifice for each one of them would be offered. When the seven days were about to come to an end, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple. And they stirred up the whole crowd and grabbed Paul. Men of Israel, they shouted, Help! This is the man who goes everywhere teaching everyone against the people of Israel, the law of Moses and this temple. And now he has even brought some Gentiles into the temple and defiled this holy place. They said this because they had seen Trophimus from Ephesus with Paul in the city. And they thought that Paul had taken him into the temple. Confusion spread through the whole city and the people all ran together, grabbed Paul and dragged him out of the temple. At once the temple doors were closed and the mob was trying to kill Paul when a report was sent up to the commander of the Roman troops that all of Jerusalem was rioting. At once the commander took some officers and soldiers and rushed down to the crowd and when the people saw him with the soldiers they stopped beating Paul. The commander went over to Paul, arrested him, and ordered him to be tied up with two chains. Then he asked, who is this man and what has he done? Some in the crowd shouted one thing, others something else. There was such confusion that the commander could not find out exactly what had happened. So he ordered his men to take Paul up into the fort. They got with him to the steps. And then the soldiers had to carry him because the mob was so wild. And they were all coming after him and screaming, Kill him. We'll stop there and take the story further next Sunday morning. When I read a biography about a great man or a great Christian... I'm far more interested in what he is than in what he has done. One wants to know what makes him tick. Some biographies just give you the outside of a man's life and where he went and what he did. But you want to get behind that and you want to get inside the man and feel as he felt and understand things as he understood them. And this is the interest that comes out as you read the Bible. You read the Gospels and at first you're simply interested in the man who stilled the storm and raised the dead and made the lame walk and the deaf hear and the blind see. You're interested in what Jesus did, but after a bit you find yourself saying, but what was Jesus like inside? Who was he? What made him tick? Why did he react as he did? And it's true also that with the story of Paul, at first you get a list of the places he went to and what he did and the miracles that happened. But after a bit you find yourself saying, I'd like to know what Paul was really like. I'd like to know what he was like inside. I'd like to know how he thought and why he reacted as he did. And chapter 21 in the book of Acts tells us a very great deal about the man in his own heart. It's not a chapter I would have taken ever unless I was going through Acts. That's the great advantage or disadvantage for preachers who work their way through the Bible. They can't pick and choose the nice texts. And you come to a chapter like this and you look at it and you say, why did you put that in the Bible, Lord? It's of historical interest, yes, and uh, it's got some very interesting, complicated situations about the Jews and the Gentiles, but what have you got to say to us today? Well, let me try and tell you what God has said to me through this chapter. There are three relationships which every Christian has to develop. His relationship with God, his relationship with his neighbor, and his relationship with his fellow Christians. And without any hesitation, I say personally that the third is the hardest of the three. It's comparatively easy to love God. After all, he's such a lovable person. Hope you don't think that's a reference, but he is. And the more you know about God, the more you love him. And the more you feel what a wonderful person he is. So to love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength is comparatively easy. And then what about your neighbor? Well, you can pretty well choose your neighbors. I've told you about the woman who went out of church muttering, I'd like to see our vicar love my neighbor, but I don't know what kind of a person she sat next or lived next to. 
But Jesus said, your neighbor is anyone at all who is in need of your help. And it's comparatively easy for human nature, seeing someone in real need, to want to do something about it. But when it comes to your fellow Christians, that's a different matter. As one dear lady used to say to me in our previous church, after every church meeting, the Lord has a funny family. And he has. <laughs> and all the world's queer but me and thee, and I'm not so sure about thee. And you don't choose your brothers and sisters when you're born. You don't even choose to be born. But when I was born, I was born with two sisters. I didn't choose them. I had to learn to live with them. We didn't always manage it. And when you're born again into God's family, you find you're in a family of brothers and sisters. And you can't choose those brothers and sisters. Those who belong to Christ are part of you. Some of them you will like immediately. Some of them you will not. But God says this will be the proof to all people that you belong to me. Not that you wear an Arthur Blessed badge. Not that you carry your Bible up here. And not that you go to church, but that you are rightly related to your fellow Christians, that you love one another. It's the one argument that no one can deny for the proof of God's reconciling power. If they can come into a fellowship and see Christians who would otherwise never have met, really related to each other, they've got an unanswerable, logical argument for the gospel. And that is why Satan puts fellowship between Christians high on his list of priorities to demolish. And he can do it so easily. He can either do it by forming cliques or clubs within a church of like-minded people of the same age and the same background and the same outlook so that the church is divided into groups, all the young people in this corner, all the older people in that corner, all the wealthy people in this corner and all the poorer people in that corner and so on and so forth. Or he can even take a group of people out of a church because they don't like the others in the church or the way they behave. But it is the proof to others that Christians are related to each other as brothers and sisters. And one of the questions which we find most difficult to answer is this. How far should an individual Christian take the advice of other Christians? How far should I, as a Christian, listen to my fellow brothers and sisters when I don't know what to do? Or when they tell me to do something or not to do something, how far should I listen to them? In this unusual chapter, we have one situation in which Christians plead with Paul not to do something, and he goes right ahead and does it. And then, a few days later, we find Christians begging him to do something, and he goes right ahead and does it. And on both occasions, he gets into trouble for the decision he made. And things don't work out very well. Nor, I'm afraid, does the Bible say in this chapter on either occasion whether he did right or wrong. We were discussing the chapter through in the changing rooms here with one of the people who is going to be baptized this evening. And he said to me, you know, life is very like Acts 21. You don't always know whether you've done right or wrong. You're not always sure if you have made the right decision. Sometimes you listen to Christians, sometimes you don't. But life is this kind of muddle. On the other hand, the way we make those decisions and the way we react to the advice of Christians reveals to us a far more important thing. In chapter 21, it is not so important to study what Paul decides to do as why he decided to do it. Why in the one case he went against Christians pleading and in the other case he followed it. Now let's look at the two situations. You can trace the journey on a map if you want to, but I'm not going to trace the journey at all. I'm just going to highlight two towns they called at when the ship called in at the ports, Tyre and Caesarea. And in both cases, Christians pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem, and it did no good at all. He went straight on. Now, why did he ignore what they said? 
Well, now, in Tyre, they met a few Christians. By now, there were little groups of Christians in every town and port in the world. And wherever you went, you'd find them. And so they found them and spent a day there, and, or was it a week in Tyre? And they met the believers, and they met for worship. Now, one of the things that can happen in Christian worship is this. There can be prophecy, which is not preaching. Preaching is explaining to, the, to people the meaning of what God has already said. Prophecy is a new word from God for the people in that place at that time. And the Spirit of God can use a person's mouth, sometimes the most unlikely person, to give a word from God for that people at that time at that place. Not a word that's going to add anything to the Bible. It doesn't need to be written in the back as an extra addition. But a word that is going to speak to that immediate situation about God. We've had some words of prophecy this week. There were some quite amazing words concerning July the 12th in Northern Ireland. And there was much prayer as we listened to a Protestant woman from Belfast and a Catholic priest from Dublin with their arms around each other telling us that the Holy Spirit is jumping the barricades in Belfast with Catholics going through the barbed wire to Protestant homes for prayer and vice versa. A new thing is happening. And we were told of how a Catholic girl knelt at the feet of a Protestant girl in one of these prayer meetings recently and begged for the forgiveness from that Protestant for the bitterness in her heart because a relative of hers had been killed by the Protestants. And she had singled out the only girl in the prayer meeting who had had a relative killed by the Catholics who then begged for forgiveness for her bitterness and resentment. And we were given an assurance from God on the Wednesday evening in various ways in different meetings that God was going to control Belfast on Orange Day and that he had the situation in his hands and that there would be peace. And you can guess what we felt like when we heard the news on Thursday evening and Friday morning. Did you hear the news? No, you didn't, because there wasn't any. And God can speak to a particular situation about a particular thing those weren't words that needed to go in the Bible or be added to the Bible. They were God's words for that situation. And when Paul went to Tyre, he was given such a word by the, by the Spirit of God through one of the believers. It was not a word that there would be peace, but a word that if he went up to Jerusalem, he was heading straight for danger and disaster, that there was trouble waiting for him. And the word came through that Paul, if he continued on the journey, was heading for trouble. And the next sentence says, but we went on our way. Why did Paul ignore that word from the Spirit of God? Why did he go on? The next place they called in was Caesarea. And much the same thing happened. This church was full of prophets and prophetesses. There was one man there, first of all appointed a deacon, of the church in Jerusalem but who developed the gift of, of an evangelist and now he was living in Caesarea and he had four daughters who were prophetesses and who were often used in this way and the New Testament while it does not have women teachers in the church most certainly has women prophets and they proclaimed the word of God and they were mouthpieces for God but it wasn't one of the four women who spoke it was a man called Agabus We've come across him earlier in the book of Acts when by the Spirit of God he predicted a famine and told them to get a fund ready for the famine when it came. That's unusual, isn't it? For Christians to start collecting money for a disaster that hasn't happened. The world can only collect for a disaster after it's occurred. But in this case, Agabus the prophet got the Christians ready beforehand. Here he is again. And he takes Paul's belt from around his coat and he takes it off and he binds his hands and his feet and he says the owner of this belt is going to be tied up in Jerusalem. Once again a word from God through the Christians to Paul. And when they heard this all Paul's friends gathered around including his dear personal friend Dr. Luke who wrote all about this and they pleaded with him with tears in their eyes Paul please don't go. And Paul said, please, stop breaking my heart. You'll wear down my resistance in a moment. I'm going. 
I don't mind if I am tied up. I'm ready to die, but I'm going. Now, why did Paul ignore what these Christians said? One very simple reason. It was a human concern for him that made them say it. You notice that what God said was that he would be tied up. It was men who were saying, then don't go. And this is an instinctive human reaction when there's danger or trouble. Avoid it. And the assumption was being made by Christians that if God was going to tell us of trouble on ahead, he was doing so so that you could avoid it. Far from that. God was not telling this to Paul to discourage Paul from going, but to encourage him to fill him and prepare him. That's why this Bible of mine tells you about great troubles coming on the earth. Building up to the end of history when the trouble will be worse than ever, it's called the big trouble in the Bible, the great tribulation. And I know many Christians who are hoping to get out of it before it happens. But when I read my Bible, we are told about the big trouble not to get out of it, but to prepare to go into it. And I notice that in today's English version, there's a verse in Revelation 7, which is translated, These are they who have come safely through the great persecution. And that's truer to the Greek. Come through it victorious. If God tells you trouble is coming, he's not telling you that in order for you to run away. He's telling you that, that you may receive courage and strength and prepare for it and seek his grace to get the anchor down before the storm blows up. And that's what he was doing here. And when the Christians were pleading with Paul not to go, it was their human concern for him. But for Paul himself, when Christians were concerned about his safety, his health, his comfort, his welfare, he said, nothing doing, I'm going. And we Christians can be overprotective because of our human concern for one another. But Paul said in Acts 20, God has told me to go to Jerusalem. And these warnings of the Holy Spirit are to prepare me, to encourage me. I'm going up bound in the Spirit. I've just got to go. So please don't break my heart. Please don't deflect me from my purpose. And as I read this part of the story, I was seeing something that happened some years before in the north of Galilee when Jesus said to his disciples, I've got to go to Jerusalem. And when I get there, they're going to arrest me. They're going to try me. They're going to kill me. They're going to crucify me. And dear Simon Peter, with all the love in his heart, with all the concern for the dearest friend he'd ever known, said, Oh, Lord, no, no, not that. You mustn't go. You mustn't go anywhere near such trouble. And Jesus recognized this deep human concern as a point at which Satan could tempt by deflecting him from his course. Sometimes we've got to be on our guard that the concern of other Christians for our welfare is not a little loophole for the devil to turn us from something God has told us to do. So in this situation, he didn't do what the Christians said because their concern was about him and he was not concerned about himself. But now let's turn to another totally different situation. He arrived in Jerusalem, met the Christians there, told them all that the Lord had done for him on his missionary tours, and they were thrilled and they praised God, and then they said, Now, Paul, we've got a bit of a problem. We'll not hide anything from you. You're an embarrassment to us. People are going to talk now that you're here. And the problem is one that doesn't occur to us. But let me just tell you what it was, and then you've got the background. The problem is the old one of when you become a Christian, how much of your background do you have to give up? When you come to the Lord, how much of your culture do you have to drop? For the Gentiles who came to Christ, the question was simple. They had to drop all idolatry and all immorality and anything connected with those two things. But when a Jew came to Jesus, how much should he drop? since he was never guilty of idolatry, worshipped only one true God, 
and his laws were laws of high morality. How much should he drop? And the answer, surprisingly, is nothing. If a Jew comes to Christ, he can go on being a Jew. The only thing that Paul said quite simply and utterly dogmatically in the letter to the Galatians was this. A Jew becoming a Christian can stay a Jew, but he mustn't ever tell a Gentile becoming a Christian he must become a Jew. Now that is why some of you know there is a synagogue in Jerusalem today, the synagogue of Jesus the Messiah. And it's full of Jews who go on with the Jewish culture and the Jewish customs, but who believe in Jesus the Messiah. Now, said James, I'm afraid your coming will upset these people because they've heard rumors that you not only tell Gentiles they needn't become Jews, you're telling Jews that they can stop being Jews. And this is a thing Paul never did and never taught. And so they said, for the sake of the other Christians in Jerusalem, would you please join in with four people in a rite, a ceremony of purification that will put you right with them because they will see that you are still practicing Jewish culture. Now, some people would say, Paul, hold on. You're going to be led straight into compromise. Paul, after writing the letter to the Galatians, you can't do it. But Paul was a big man with a big heart. And Paul listened to the Christians and he did what they said. Why? Because for Paul, the unity of Christians is a very important thing. If they told him to do something because of their concern for him, he didn't listen. But if they told him to do something because of their concern for other brothers in Christ, Paul would fall over backwards to cooperate. Now that's a very interesting thing. Sometimes we are called to do things that people might misunderstand, that people might accuse us of being inconsistent, and I believe something is going to happen in this service tonight which is in exactly that category but where something should be done for the sake of fellowship with the brethren if nothing else. And this is Paul's principle here. He listened to the Christians now and did something that he could have argued was unnecessary, that he could have said was not helpful in the light of events it proved to be a disaster. But he did it because he loved Christians. Some of us during this week at Nottingham had to do this too. I, I'll be frank and make a confession now. When I arrived, I was giving lectures on Galatians. And you've heard me speak on Galatians and you know what it's about. And you know that it isn't a very comfortable letter for Roman Catholics. And the chairman, I was told, was a Roman Catholic priest. And <laughs> Tom Smale there had organized this. And I thought he either had a sense of humor or <laughs> something very deep. But, you know, I had to unlearn something. Because at the end of my first lecture on Galatians, in which I spoke of freedom from trying to be good enough, freedom from trying to mix faith and works, but that we are saved by faith alone in Jesus. And he paid it all, and there's nothing else to work off that he paid the full penalty. This dear brother got up at the end of the lecture and gave his own testimony how after being filled with the Spirit in Dublin, the first thing he read was Paul's letter to the Galatians. And he said, it's now one of my favorite epistles because it describes the liberty I discovered after trying for years to keep the commandments. And then I found freedom in the Spirit. So I had to unlearn something there and had to realize that you do have to do things that otherwise you might not want to do for the sake of the fellowship of those who truly belong to Jesus Christ and so Paul said yes I'll do it I'll do something that I don't need to do I'll do something that I maybe don't want to do but I'll do it because you have advised me that this will remove the rumors and will set my fellow Christians hearts at rest that what they think about me is not true and I want them to see it and so he went into the temple paid the expenses of the rite bought the sacrifices for the other four chaps shaved his head with them and entered into that thing which Christ had not told him to do 
which was not part of the Christian life, but which was something that would draw him closer to the brethren. No principle was involved. The gospel was not being denied. So he did it. Now, do you see the difference? Here's a man who would not do anything for his own sake, even at the advice of other Christians, but whose heart could always be touched by an appeal to other Christians and their welfare. So that Paul is not inconsistent in this chapter. He's not contradicting himself. He's showing a divine consistency, a complete lack of concern for his own welfare, and a total concern for the welfare of his brothers and sisters in Christ. Isn't that a lovely attitude and a model for us Christians to take? Of course it didn't work out. It did go wrong. And those who say that if things go wrong it can't have been in the Lord have a bit of a problem with this chapter. And I suppose none of us will ever get to know what was right or wrong in this situation until we get to glory. I'm just looking forward to getting old Paul and saying, Paul, I've got a number of questions. I've had them for many years and... <laughs> And we've all had them at Millmead, so would you tell me now, and then I'll pass it on to the others. Actually, when I get to see Paul in glory, I'm quite sure I won't bother with the questions. But I'd love just to get Paul and say, Paul, do you regret doing that now? What do you feel about those two decisions now in the light of eternity? I have the feeling Paul would still, still say this. Well, maybe I wasn't sure at the time, but I was sure of this, that if God had told me to do something, I mustn't let other Christians put me off for my safety. And I'm still sure of this, that it's always good to bend over backwards to remove false rumors that are dividing Christians from one another. And so we take those two principles into our baptismal service. There may be gossip after this service and misunderstanding, but God knows the heart and God knows what is right for the heart to do. Now he did get into trouble, a riot started. He was seen in the temple, he was accused of breaking the law. Do you know that in 1871 and again in 1935, archaeologists discovered blocks of stone in the ruins of Jerusalem, digging among the dust. They found two blocks of stone which belonged to the wall around the inner temple and carved on the stone that they have dug up are these words. No man of alien race is to enter within the balustrade and fence that goes round the temple and if anyone is taken in the act let him know that he has himself to blame for the penalty of death that follows and that notice was all round the temple the Gentiles could come into the outer court but not through the middle wall of partition now Paul had preached that in Christ the middle wall of partition is down and it's gone. There's no division now. Anybody can come right into the holy place of God's presence. But Paul did not violate that Jewish law. He had not taken a Gentile in. He was being falsely accused of doing so. In spirit, he had broken that wall down by preaching that Christianity was for all. But in practice, he had not broken it down. He had respected the scruple of the Jew. But he was accused of not doing so. And a riot started and they beat him and they dragged him. And the soldiers just caught him in the nick of time. We'll see next Sunday morning. He was saved by four things. He was saved by his Greek language, his Roman citizenship, his Hebrew blood and his Christian experience. But that's for next Sunday morning. But he was saved in the nick of time. And the crowd shouted, kill him, kill him, kill him. You know, as I read that, my mind went a little further back into the New Testament. The irony of history. In that very city, about 20 years or so previously, a young man called Stephen became the first Christian to die for his faith. And he was accused of doing exactly the same thing, of breaking down the Jewish law. Falsely accused. And they had dragged Stephen out. The mob had taken him through the gate and outside the city they'd thrown rocks on him until he died. And he died asking the, the God above to forgive those who stoned him to death. And there was a young man there holding the coats 
of those who had stoned Stephen to death. And the young man was this man, Paul. And now here he was in the same city. And the same crowd are shouting, kill him, kill him. How very strange that the young Saul had approved the death of Stephen and now for the same reason found himself in the same situation. But let's go a little further back. It was in this same city that the Lord Jesus had likewise been caught by the crowd and likewise they had shouted, kill him, kill him, kill him. And I have the feeling that as Paul was carried, he literally had to be carried aloft by the soldiers back to the fortress Antonia, which looked out over the temple area. And as they carried him high, I just have the feeling that Paul was thinking about Stephen and about Jesus. He'd come full circle now. He'd once been among those who held the coats and said, Stone him, stone him. Now as a servant of Christ, he was in the same boat. My last word to you tonight is this. If you do what you believe to be right in the sight of the Lord, expect trouble, expect misunderstanding, accept people to expect them to say false things. But then you're called to share the sufferings of Jesus. He never called us to an easy life. He called us to take up our cross and follow him. He never said that if you do what's right, everybody will understand and be thrilled. And I say to the two who are being baptized, you're doing what's right, but people will not understand. There will be those who will misunderstand and say, what do you do that for? There may be those who will accuse you of false actions and even false motives. Count yourselves blessed because you're following the steps of Jesus. And what is baptism but having taken up the cross of Christ, being willing to be buried with him and raised with him, identified with him in his passion so that you may share the joy, sharing his sufferings that you may share the joy of risen life afterwards. So lift up your heads. Jesus taught us to be thrilled when trouble comes. In the world you will have trouble, tribulation, but cheer up, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so as you experience misunderstanding and trouble and gossip and even anger on the part of people who don't understand what you're doing, then feel very close to Jesus Christ, for he's right there. Let us pray. Father, there are many situations in which we're not sure what is your will. And perhaps even after we've done something, we may have doubts. But Lord, we praise you that we're quite sure of two things, that we should not be concerned about ourselves, that we should be concerned about our fellow Christians. And Lord, if those are our motives, we thank you that you accept them, because they please you too. And Lord, forgive us that it's so easy for us to run away from trouble and danger and difficulty. Thank you, Lord, that you strengthen our hearts, you put courage in our hearts by telling us beforehand what we are to go through so that we may seek your strength and your grace, that when the crisis comes upon us, when the winds blow and the rains descend, the house stands because it's built on rock, on your word. Thank you, Lord, for what you've said to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The hymn number 510. Take up thy cross, the Saviour said, If thou wouldst my disciple be, Take up thy cross with willing heart, And humbly follow after me. 510.